And it's hard to follow that with something serious. <laughs> that was pretty good. That was pretty funny. I haven't, I haven't seen such a good little marriage icebreaker. I like that. Um, I'll pray. How about that? Let's pray. Father God, we come to you in the name of Jesus. And Lord, we thank you for your goodness today. We thank you for your mercy, God. We thank you for every couple in this room, individual in this room. And Lord, I thank you that your hand is upon us. I thank you that you have a word for these people today that will help them, encourage them, strengthen them, and inspire them in every way. We thank you for it, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, this morning I want to talk about the power of agreement. And... uh, the power of agreement. And a lot of times in marriage, that's the one thing that is a big, big deal is that there is always something coming between us, right? We talked about last night how we all have uh, different personalities from one another. We have different strengths. We have different weaknesses. And in that, that can cause friction, And so one of the number one tactics of the enemy to try and get in and to destroy our marriages is to cause disagreement and to rob us of our unity. And so he is incessant in his attacks and and trying to bring that constant disagreement between us so that he can ultimately destroy us. There There is an enemy out there and an adversary out there that does not like you and does not like your marriage, doesn't like what it represents. And so he is constantly going to fight against it. And um, in Matthew 12, 25, we see it very clearly, and Jesus is talking, and he says, any kingdom that fights against itself will end up in ruins. And any family or community splintered by strife will fall apart. So he puts it very clearly, if you fight against each other, you will end up in ruins. You will fall apart. If you are in strife in your marriage, your home, and your family, and I know there, there are seasons of marriage, and, and in the beginning, there's not too much to fight about that is of significance, right? In the beginning, we're fighting about dumb stuff, you know, because you're, you're living together now, and you're like, you know, he snores too much, or, you know, the toothpaste, and, you know, just really small, insignificant things. And as you grow in your marriage, there's other things, you know, you start having children, and, you know, those those disagreements are more like, you know, I, I'm the one that always gets up in the middle of the night. I'm the one that changes all the diapers, or I'm, you know, I'm doing this, and you're not doing anything. And, and then as your kids grow, you, you have teenagers. And that can be another thing, because how many know, even kids, younger kids, they know how to try and work you against each other, right? They know how to come to mom. And my, our, one of our sons did it yesterday. He texted me, he's like, hey, mom, can Gavin spend the night? Um, while y'all are gone. And I said, I don't know. Um, Check with your dad. Those were my words. He shows me a text from our son that says, hey, mom said it's fine if Gavin spends the night. She just said to run it by you. And he was like, did you? I was like, that's not at all what I said. My kids are always, I did it. I did it to my parents all the time. Go, go. And they listen. And you're always like, go, go ask dad, go ask mom. And so there's all these just little things that can try to come in between us. And you know, in, in marriage ceremonies, weddings, they're beautiful. And we say all these beautiful things and it, and it, and it seems just like it's just going to be so wonderful. And if you heard that scripture that said in, in wedding ceremonies a lot is, um, one can put a thousand to flight and two can put 10,000 to flight. And so sometimes you hear something so many times that it loses it, its significance, right? And you almost forget even what it's supposed to mean. And But in saying that, it's supposed to depict the power that comes from the two becoming one. And so as individuals, we can only do so much. But when we come together, that's when power comes. How many of y'all played Red Rover growing up? You played Red Rover. Our kids don't even know what Red Rover is probably. They're like, no, if it's not on a screen, we haven't played it yet. So... 
But in Red Rover, right, if, if you're standing there alone, it would be easy for you to, to be taken out, right? But when you're standing there with someone else, there's that significance because now there is power in that unity. Come here, babe. There's power in that unity because now you have someone standing there with you. Pastor, come help us. <laughs> come help us. Okay. Just come on. No, you're going to, no, you're going to, you're going to, no, oh, you're, you're our runner. Oh, let's use my right hand. <laughs> okay, so listen. If there, this is what happens when there is disagreement between us, though. Okay, disagreement between us. Okay, yeah. Right. Oh no, no, no! I gotta call you over. God Almighty, this guy. Okay, Red Rover, Red Rover, send Pastor right over. Disagreement. Okay, we disagree. Get back over there, Pastor. Okay, when we're when there's disagreement between us we're automatically going to be apart because there is disagreement what between us. There's something between us. And so when there's something between us, there is no unity. And so when there's no unity, there's no power. And so when we choose to be, to be in agreement, you're not going to break through. When you, we choose to be in agreement, we have power that we would not have on our own. And so then when we say Red Rover, Red Rover sent Pastor right over, he can't get through, right? Be seated, be seated. But that's why the enemy is always trying to get something between us. And it can be big things, it can be small things, but he knows if I can stand in the middle between them, then they cannot stand. And they will fall. And that's ultimately what happens when we begin as couples to fight against each other. We fight against each other, then we will end up in ruins. So we have to learn how to be on the same page. And we have to know and be aware that the enemy, every time there is disagreement and every time there is strife between us, recognize what is happening. And so many times we are fighting with flesh and blood, and it is not a flesh and blood fight. And so if the enemy can get you distracted with flesh and blood, then you don't show up for the real fight. Because the real fight is against the powers of darkness. The real fight is, is against Satan and what he's trying to do. But when you're too busy fighting with one another, you don't show up for that fight. You only fight against flesh and blood. So that is what you're really working with. So when, when disagreements and arguments and strife come in, you have to stop and recognize what is happening. You're not fighting with a person. You're fighting with something stronger that is behind that. And so that's why it's so, so important to understand the power of your unity. So when you come together as one, that doesn't mean you, you lose your individuality. It doesn't mean that you just completely lose yourself, your call, your gifts, your talents. A lot of times people, um, you know, when they get married, they, they feel like, oh, well, now I just, I'm just this new person that I can't, I don't have my own dreams or plans and, da -da, and all of that. That's not, that's not what it's supposed to be. It, you don't lose yourself. You just join yourself to someone else. And so it's actually supposed to be a beautiful thing where now you bring your gifts and your talents and your callings and your abilities that God put on the inside of you and you join it to, to this other person and then they bring their gifts and their talents and their abilities, what God has called them to do. And you bring it together and it's so much more powerful and so much more beautiful when it's brought together but a lot of times people feel like you are trying to you're trying to uh to rob me of of what I want to do this is what I want to do have you ever had that argument where it's, you know, well, this is, this is where, what I want to do with my life. This is what I think that we should do. This is what I've always, this is the career path I've always wanted to take. And so you have your, the wife over here wanting to do all the things that she wants to do. And then the husband over here saying, well, this is what we're going to do. And this is how it's supposed to be. And now we're one. And we're, you know, that's usually how it is. We're one. We're one together. So automatically you're supposed to want to do what I want to do. And the wife is going, oh, uh-uh, I'm still my own person. I'm 
going to do what I want to do. And really, you just have to learn that neither, you're not individuals now, but you are individuals joined together. And so it's important to recognize and realize that you don't, you're not losing your individuality, but you're actually adding to your individuality. It's not a subtraction. It's an adding to that now I get to not just be who I am. I get to have this amazing partner on my side and on my team. And now we're walking together into what God has called us to do. And so I think too many times people get confused and feel like um, if, they, if they feel like that they can't have their own individuality. No, don't lose yourself. Don't lose who you are. He wants you to use who you are to better the person that he puts you with. And so you have to be able to, to be selfless and to be humble and, and to be able to say, I'm joining myself to you. And what, it, what is mine is not just mine anymore. And what is yours is not just yours anymore. But I'm going to freely give you what I have. And you freely give me what, I ha- what you have. And we're going to use these things together. That's what two becoming one is. That's what it's all about. In fi- Ephesians 5.21, it says... Submit yourselves one to another. So that is a give and take on both sides of submitting yourselves one to another. This isn't just in marriage. This is in life, being able to submit yourselves to one another. And there is no submission without humility. So if you have an issue with pride, and if you do, you, you would never say it, so... <laughs> I'll let your spouse, ask your, sp- I have one, okay, I have it. Ask your spouse if you have an issue with pride and be willing to hear the answer. But there is, so, there is no submission without humility. And humility is being able and willing to hear a different viewpoint than your own. Being able to say, okay, I only see what I see. I only know what I know. Now you show me what I can't see. You show me what you see through your eyes. So, Submission becomes, um, it starts with humility, but then also taking it a step further is saying, now I'm going to try and come into a, an alignment with the way that you feel. And so that can be very hard, but if you work on it and if you can have open communication and meet in the middle, it can happen. So there's no unity without being in alignment. You have to become in alignment with one another and say, okay, this is how we're going to move forward in this. And sometimes there, th- there are things that you agree to disagree in a kind way, in a way that's not causing strife in between you. So anytime the enemy wants to stop you, he's going to try and disrupt your unity. Have you all ever heard the phrase, um, it's the little foxes that spoil the vine, right? So in a lot of marriages, it's not one big event that causes a a marriage to be destroyed. It's little things along the way. Sometimes there are big events, but for the majority marriages that end, it's, it's from a bunch of little things along the way. And so we have to be aware of those little things. Now, only you know the foxes that spoil the vine in your marriage. But I want to talk about a few, a few foxes that may spoil the vine in marriages. Unmet expectations. Everyone knows about unmet expectations because if you got married um, and you didn't have like, now I feel nowadays there's much more premarital, like all these books and these, these counseling sessions you can go to and you can talk about all these things. But that hasn't always been that way. And so a lot of times you go into a marriage with expectations that have never been spoken, Right? There are expectations that you have that you think the other person has too, but not even close. It's not on the same page at all. And so there's unmet expectations that have never been spoken. And every time an expectation goes unmet, there is a seed of resentment that is planted. And so through these unmet expectations, there's little resentments along the way that are being built up on the inside. And 
That's why a lot of times in marriage counseling, when we, mar- when we counsel people, we're like, you've got to talk about expectations. Because if you don't talk about them and you're frustrated every time an expectation is not met. And they didn't even know you were expecting that. When you first get married, like my husband may have, may have you know, expected bacon and eggs every morning. And, you know, I didn't know that was an expectation. I don't want to do that. But, and, you know, and I, have, I may have had an expectation of him. And these are hypothetical, guys. I make bacon and eggs every morning. Um, <laughs> but... You know, I may have been expecting, you know, a a handyman that can, you know, do whatever I need him to do and whenever I need him to do it. And so when when there is something that goes undone, now what, I'm frustrated because I expected this to happen without me even asking. He expected bacon and eggs without even asking. So uh, there are so many unmet expectations. And so when we tell people, okay, listen, you need to... Write down, write them down. Sit down and say, okay, this is, this is what my expectations, right or wrong, this is my, what my expectations are. You write down, what are your expectations, and let's talk about them, and let's talk about which ones we're going to do and which ones we're not. But at least there's something out there to where you're not suffering in silence and have all these things going on in your mind that you think that they should be doing and they're not doing, and then it's these little foxes that get in. And they start spoiling the vine. Number, another one would be an unkept thought life. An unkept thought life toward your spouse. And what I mean by that, um, if, if you continue to feed on every accusing thought about your spouse, you will begin to come into alignment with that thought. And whatever the enemy is trying to, to bring forth with that thought, it starts to happen. And you start to form your belief system about your spouse based on a thought because you are not keeping your thought life. You are transformed and you are conformed by the the meditation of your heart. The things that you fix your, your mind on, the things that you fix your thoughts on, the things that you roll over, meditate on over and over and over. You know, a lot of times you think of meditation, meditating on the word. Well, you're meditating on something all day long. And so there are thoughts that come to you, and they're coming straight from the enemy, and they have a purpose, and they're to bring destruction and to bring strife and accusation. And the enemy, he is the accuser of the brethren. So if there's accusing thoughts going on in your mind, know where that is coming from. And it is coming from the accuser, and he's trying to bring in that doubt and that strife and that resentment and that bitterness because you're not keeping your thought life in check. You have to recognize the thoughts when they come and say, okay, no, 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 no. That's not, I'm not going to feed on that. I'm not going to do that because you will conform to that way of thinking about your spouse. Um, Another thing is poor communication. We talked a lot about communication last night, but if it is not safe to communicate your feelings to your spouse and without them taking it as a personal attack or you taking it as a personal attack or you taking it um, not validating your spouse's feelings, um, then you will begin to not communicate at all. And when you don't communicate at all, um, it only leaves the door open for the enemy to come in 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 a lot of different ways. And so Communication is so key and important. Having the hard conversations, saying the things that you need to say, saying them how you need to say them. The communication is so, so vital. All right. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> so these are just a few examples. But I know you all know the foxes in your own marriage. And so I want you to think about those things. What are the little things in your own marriage that time after time it just starts to build up resentment? Because there are times where you could get at a place in your marriage where you're like, I, how did we get here? Like, how, how did we get here? How are we, how are we, or you could be, we've been married for 40 years, or we've been married for 15 years. How are we still here? How are we still fighting about the same things? How are, how, how are we right here? There, there are times in your life where you will think that. 
and be like, I don't know how I got here. You got here from the little foxes, the little things that were never addressed, the little things that you let get in, the thoughts that you let come and that you fed on, you let stay and begin to to form the way that you think about your spouse. You let them in by the unmet expectations. You let them in by not communicating and not talking about those things, having those hard conversations. So it is so important to recognize those little foxes. Now I want to talk about, um, I want to talk about the fruit of unity. So if one can put a thousand to flight, and two can put ten thousand to flight, then power must be a fruit of your unity. Power is a fruit of your unity. If you could understand that um, we can be more powerful when we are unified, then you would, you would go ahead and decide, I'm not going to be petty. I'm not going to let stupid little arguments. I'm not going to let things come in and stay in. I'm not going to let thoughts come. I'm not going to let not being able to communicate. I'm not going to let all those things come because they're robbing us of our power. If you want power in your marriage, there has to be unity. So it is a very, very vital thing for you to stay in unity because then you become powerful. We are stronger together. We're, we're better together. We can do more together than when we are apart. So we have to stay in unity if we want power. This is why the enemy is incessant in his attempts to bring disagreement. Because he wants to bring uh, division. And where, where there is division, you cannot walk together. You cannot walk the same direction when there is division. When you choose to walk Together, you're walking in the same direction, in, in the same vision, the same unity. And so together, you're walking in power and what God has for you. So the enemy is constantly going to try and cause disunity, disagreement, and division. You have to be aware of it. You have to be aware of his tactics. Because a lot of times he uses the same exact thing. And we're dumb enough to fall for it every time, right? He uses the same exact thought, the same exact argument, the, the same little things all the time. And you just keep falling for it. Until you become aware and say, no, 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 I know what's happening right now. I know what's happening. I know what the enemy, ultimately what the enemy's trying to do is to cause division between us. And I'm not falling for it. We're not falling for it this time. We're going to get together and we're going to figure this thing out together because we want to have power. We want to do more. We want to accomplish more. We want our lives to be more fruitful. You can't do that when you're not on the same page. You can't do that as individuals. You have to do it together. When there is strife in your marriage, it, you become weak. So just imagine the more disagreement, the more division, the more strife, the more arguing, the weaker you are becoming as a couple. So just choose. I'm not letting that in. I'm not. I'm a grown-up. <laughs> I am a Christian, and I am choosing to not fall for that anymore. And listen, one of the best things that you can do is have people, and we talked, touched on it for a minute last night, but have people in your life, not a girlfriend, not a Facebook, not anything like that, but have godly mentors and leaders and pastors, counselors in your life that you can go to and say, hey, we're having a problem and we need help. Amen. I was meeting with a lady the other day and she was telling me all, all of the problems and all of the issues. But, and, and we, he had someone too the other day that wanted to talk to him about all the problems he was having with his spouse. And, 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 and we said, this is never going to work as long as we're, we're doing this not together. We're going to have to come together, and we're going to have to talk about this. You have to have someone that can come in and objectively see both sides and objectively give you some advice. And that's spiritual guidance. That's not, uh, that's not um, just going and Googling. 
<laughs> because we can Google all day long, and, and it's going to be some worldly advice. That's not just calling up a friend. Now, if this is a spirit-filled friend that you know is going to give you godly counsel and advice and, and from the word of God rather than just agreeing with you, then that's different. But you need to go to a mentor, a leader, a pastor, someone that you can trust and someone that you know is going to give you godly counsel and, and lay it out there. Because if you think that you can do it on your own, you cannot. You cannot. I don't care who you are. You cannot do it on your own. We need each other. And there's a reason why God has put pastors in our lives, and it's to help us. It's to help. It's to show us our blind spots. Show us the things that we can't see about ourselves and that we won't hear from our spouse. You need someone else to come in and say, you need to do this and you need to do that. And this is what the word says. It's so, so important. I got off, got off on that. So... Um, make sure that you have those people in your life. And men, I know it's harder for you usually to want to talk to someone about problems because you think, we got this, and plus you don't want anyone else to know your problems. <laughs> but unless you want to keep them, you should probably talk to someone about them. <laughs> okay, babe, come up here and do this with me. What are we doing? Issues. Oh, gotcha. Yeah, Okay. This is something that we, that we do. When we have an issue between us, between us, and when we are counseling people that have an issue that is between them, we're both looking at something that is between us, and we're also looking at each other as the problem. You don't agree with me. I don't agree with you. And we have this issue that is standing between us. And it's keeping us from seeing eye to eye. And so what we have to recognize is that we're not fighting against each other. But we have to learn how to get on the same side of an issue. So a lot of times, say this is the issue. Get over here, baby. This is the issue. And this, this is how we usually fight, right? I'm here, I'm on my side of the issue, he's on his side of the issue, here is our issue. This is what is between us, this is what we cannot agree on. And so we're looking at it like this. But what we have to learn how to do is get on the same side of it and look at the issue together. And recognize that I'm not the problem, you're not the problem, the issue is the problem. And we're going to learn how to look at this together and fight against this together because as long as we thanks babe as long as we stand on the opposite side of our issues then we we're never on the same page and we're always fighting against each other but if we can get on the same side then we can attack that we can say okay let's both look at this let's, let's see how we can deal with this see how we can change it and then you have more power because you are in unity together so unity is power. Psalm 133, 1 through 3, it says, How wonderful and pleasant it is when brothers live together in harmony. For harmony is as precious as the anointing oil that was poured over Aaron's head that ran, ran down his beard and onto the border of his robe. Harmony is as refreshing as the dew mount from, from Mount Hermon that falls on the mountains of Zion. And the Lord has pronounced his blessing, even life everlasting. The number two fruit of your unity is blessing. Think about that. You want to be blessed, right? You want your family blessed? You want your children blessed? You want your finances blessed? You want your life and your future blessed? Unity. Blessing comes from unity. So I would challenge you to think about what blessings may be hindered right now in your marriage because there is no unity. And if you want a blessing released, it says, one translation says, he commands his blessing on you. Where? He commands the blessing where there is harmony. He commands a blessing where there is unity. 
man, I read this the other day and I was like, wow. It makes you want to say, oh, let's check every nook and cranny and see where there is any discord. Let's check every corner and see where we may be letting the enemy in to cause division because I don't want division because I want to be blessed. I want God to look down and say, wow, look at that union. Look at that unity. Look at that harmony. I command a blessing on them. I command a blessing on their family. I command a blessing on their finances. I command a blessing on their children. That is a fruit of unity. Nothing is worth your unity. Nothing is worth it. There is no amount of being right that is worth it. There is no argument that you want to, to win that is worth your unity. You, that, you don't want to pay your unity to be right. You don't want to pay your blessing. Lay down your blessing because you want to be right. I would rather have unity with my spouse and know that we are walking together and we have power and we're going to accomplish more and do more and go further and live my life to the fullest potential. I don't want to get to the end of my life and realize that I have unspent potential because of my own neglect or because of my own uh, neglect to, to make the corrections that I need to make, to lay down pride, to be humble. I don't want to get to the end of my life and say, I wish I would have done this. And there was these things in my heart that I never did. I never did it. No, I want to reach my fullest potential. But in order to reach my fullest potential, I have to be willing to see the things that I need to change and see how I need to grow. To reach my fullest potential in my marriage, I'm going to have to be unified. And we're going to have to have one vision and one heart and one mind. In one accord, that's when things change. That's, that's when the power of God falls. When you're in one heart, one mind, one accord, unified together. And it is possible. It is possible. You can do it. But if it has not happened thus far, that means there are going to have to be things that you change in order to do it. So if you keep doing the same thing, expecting different results... It's not going to happen. So these are the things that, okay, we need to address these things. We need to talk about things. We need to be open. We need to get unified. We need to get on the same page. We, we need to recognize strife. We need to not let the disagreements and divisions come between us because we want to be in unity. We want to have power, and we want God to command his blessing on our lives. He commands his blessing there. I know you in this room, if you made the effort to come to this marriage conference, you came on your Friday night, you came on your Saturday morning, I know that you desire more for your marriage, and you desire more for your life, and I'm telling you, it is there, it is possible. And the potential is there. And you never stop learning and growing. It doesn't matter how long you've been married. You can always grow. You can always do better. And you can always grow in your unity. This is what I want to encourage you to do today and in the coming weeks. I would love for you to sit down with your spouse and talk about the little foxes that may be spoiling the vine in your marriage. What are the little things that we're letting get in and recognize that nothing is worth it? It's not worth it. It's not worth being petty. It's not worth being selfish. Talk about the little foxes that may be spoiling the vine. And then I also want you to talk about ways that you can get on the same page. So talk about the things that, that you have division in, that you don't, you're not in agreement with, the big things. I'm not talking about little things, about the way you, you vacuum or mow the yard. If those foxes are spoiling your vine, you need a life. <laughs> there are, I'm telling you, there are bigger issues in life, bigger problems. And if that's yours, then so be it. You're doing pretty good. But just talk about those things that, okay, we need to get on the same page on this. Whether it may be um, your call, how you're walking out your call, how you're serving in your church, how you're, you're showing up for each other. Um, big things, how you're raising your kids. 
that'll get right slap in the middle between you if you don't figure that out. So you have to come into agreement on that. Find those things that, okay, we need to come into unity on this because God will command his blessing on you. And I promise you will see a change in your marriage. Let me pray for you. Father, I thank you for every couple in this room. Lord, I know that you see the enemy's tactics and his schemes against the unity of these marriages. You see the, the division and the strife, the resentment that the enemy tries to bring in and to cause destruction. And Lord, I thank you that you see every single couple. You see what you've placed on the inside of them as individuals, and you see the call that you have on them as a couple. And Lord, I thank you that you begin to stir those things up on the inside of them. Lord, I, help, I ask you to help them to see the changes that need to be made, the corrections that need to be made. Lord, I, help, I ask you to help them to come into unity with one another. Help them to see the things that they do not see, the blind spots, maybe the things that they haven't seen, they've never seen before. That, God, they would begin to see these things. And, Lord, they would begin to make the corrections that need to be made so that their, their marriage, their union can be one of power. And, God, in that, I thank you that you're commanding your blessing on these marriages. I say that their marriage is blessed. I say that their children are blessed. Their grandchildren are blessed. Their future is blessed. Their finances are blessed. Lord, I see that, the, that you see them and the commitments that they are making, the decisions that they're making, the corrections that they're making. And God, you see them and you command your blessing upon them today. Holy Spirit, help them, lead them, guide them, keep them. In Jesus' name, amen.